Well, hello, hello, hello. Peace, peace, peace. Peace and power and elevation be to all you beautiful people out there. This is your girl Tiffany coming through live in effect. I hope everybody is having a wonderful day on this beautiful Monday, Monday, August the 23rd of 2021. So, hope you guys having a wonderful day. Hope you guys are enjoying yourselves and being safe. I know many of y'all are probably at work right now. Some of y'all at home chilling. And some of y'all just doing your little workout or whatever you're doing out there. Shout out to y'all. So today I am going to get on the topic dealing with black history. So it's always important that we get into the concept about black history month. Well, not black history, just black history in general. You know, it don't have to just be a black history month thing. It can just be all year round, period. So I want to get on this topic about black history because it's very important that we uh, know about the people that played the primary role in our history and uh, and help build this society to what it is today and also in the diaspora as well. So, <clears throat> so it's a lot to get into. Um, this one I want to deal with is William Henry Ferris. So w William Henry Ferris was one the individual who was not only an advocate uh, of the Marcus Garvey movement, which is the UNIA, which stands for Universal Negro Improvement Association. I mean, excuse me, was it, did I say universal? Yeah, Universal Negro Improvement Association. Yeah, I was right, correct. And not only that, he also, um, he also read books. He was a historian. So he was at, he was able to travel to different places at the time period. So he wrote books in around 1913 and 1920. So I have those books in handy, but I all but other than that, I want to go into the information detail about William Henry Ferris and who he was as a person and what type of role he played in and um why it's important for us to know about him as far as like uh, his historical background, etc. So let's go ahead and get started. As a matter of fact, I want to show a picture of who William Henry Ferris is. As you can see, this is a picture of him. Uh, that's the only picture I was able to find. So, yeah, that's a picture of William, William Henry Ferris. All right, so let's go ahead and let's look into the information. Of course, this is everybody's favorite go-to website, Wikipedia or Wikiwine. So you'll find out more information on here. So here it is on Wikiwine. There we go. William H. Ferris was born July 20th, uh, 1874, and he died in 1941. And he was an author, minister, and scholar. Okay. He was born in New Haven, Connecticut, the son of David H. and Sarah Ann Jefferson Ferris. His grandparents were free at the time of his father's birth. His father joined the Union Army voluntary at the age of 17. His mother's father escaped from captivity on plantation and later purchased the freedom of his wife and children. All right, so let's go down to his education career. A graduate of Yale University in 1895 with a BA, Ferris subsequently took on the role of writer and lecturer. He was a Harvard Divinity, he was a Harvard Divinity School student from 1897 to 1899, graduating Harvard with a MA in journalism in 1900. After teaching at Tallahassee State State College, Florida, Florida Baptist College from 19 1900 to 1901. He worked for a number of newspapers from 1902 to 1903. He continued teaching during the years 1903 to 1905 at Henderson Normal School and Kentrell College in North Carolina. 
Ferris became pastor of Christ Congregational Church from 1904 to 1905. In 1908, he wrote a book entitled Typical Negro Traits. From 1910 to 1912, he was given charge of the colored missions of AME Zion Church of Lowell and Selman, Massachusetts as a lecturer at white churches. He went on to write The African Abroad or His Evolution in Western Civilization, tracing his development on the Caucasian Malas in 1913. Ferris held position as Assistant President General of the UNIA LCL and Associate Editor of the Negro World. Now, as I mentioned before, a lot of the people that were very well known activists and that were the earliest form of Pan Africanists were those who were in the Christian church. So the people that were Christ Christians, black ministers, bishops, pastors, they were all Pan Africanists. They were one of the first to become Pan Africanists. Okay. So they have opened up the doors, made way, foundation for all other groups out here. So if you want to be technical, they kind of open up the doors for the conscious community. If you really want to be technical about that. So it was the black church and their ideology and their idea of revolution, the social movement, the political movements, black movements. That opened up the doors of what we know today as the conscious community. They opened up the doors for that. They, they create those platforms. So if it wasn't for these black churches, there wouldn't be a conscious community. And I'm being technical about this. It wouldn't be no conscious community. Or what you call conscious community. Because they created those platforms through the ideas, through those principles they had. Through the traditions. Because you have some churches that practice African traditions. If you go to a church in Savannah, Georgia, there's a, a church that was founded by the African slaves. And in that church, they have what is called the Cosmogram, right? The African Cosmogram, which comes from the Congo. And also inside that church, you'll find uh, Arabic writings. There's Arabic writings inside that church because a lot of the people that was African from West Africa, they were Muslims. So about a good 15, 30 percent of them were Muslims. OK, and there were there were those Muslims who had converted into Christianity and there were some that remained Muslims to the day they died. So we have to go into the origin of things, okay? Because you got to pull back the layers. You really got to pull back the layers. You got to pull back the layers. All right. So I'm, I'm quite sure you can find things on other platforms. You can find it on uh, each one, teach one platform, because they can go in more depth than I can about uh, black history, especially when it comes down to the conscious community, they can go more in depth about that. Um, but yeah, they did. They created those platforms. They created a way for black people to be able to express themselves, to be proud of being black, to be proud of who they are as a people. Despite the criticism they received from other church members or other church congregations, they were still able to be proud of who they were. Make sure you guys check out Henry Louis Gates' uh, documentary called Black Churches. Check out his uh, documentaries. I strongly recommend you guys check out Henry Louis Gates because he goes in and he goes into a detail and he's very thorough about the history. So you guys check him out whenever you get a chance to. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and continue. Okay, so his activism. All right. He was a participant in the March 5th, 1897 meeting to celebrate the memory of Frederick Douglass, 
which founded the American Negro Academy, led by Alexander Cromwell, who was another one. Alexander Cromwell was another one that played a prominent role in Pan-Africanism as well. Over the coming decades, Ferris remained active among the scholars, editors, and activists of his of this first major African American learned society, refuting racist scholarship, promoting black claims to individual, social, and political equality, and studying the history and sociology of African American life. Ferris worked with William Monroe Trotter and the Boston Garden, W. E. B. Du Bois, and the Niagara Movement, John Edward Bruce, and the Negro Society for Historical Research. At the suggestion of Trotter, Ferris came to Washington in January of 1903 and spoke in opposition to more conservative approach to the black rights of Booker T. Washington in front of the Bethel Literary and Historical Society on January 6, 1903. As a reply, Richard W. Thompson spoke in front of the Second Baptist Lyceum on January 25th in support of Washington. In 1999, Jacqueline M. Moore argued that Thompson's paper failed to hold his ground against Ferris, who was present at the talk. The Second Baptist Lyceum met on February the 3rd to hear a paper by Jesse Lawson in favor of Washington. In support of Washington were Robert H. Terrell, Bishop Alexander Walters, Dr. William Bruce Evans, J.H. Ewan, and Thompson, and those against were Ferris Armand W. Scott, Lafayette M. Hershaw, T. M. Dent, Shelby James Davison, and Mrs. Ida D. Bailey. Terrell Evans, Lawson, and Thompson all owe position or favors to Washington's influences. J. I mean John C. Dancy, George H. Watt, Mrs. Anna Evans Murray, wife of Daniel Murray, Reuben S. Smith. Kelly Miller, Professor Lewis Baster Moore, and J John P. Green were neutral. This controversy continued into the summer where important me meetings in Louisville, I mean Louisville and Boston saw heated argument, which even led to blows and trotters and Grand Granville Martin's imprisonment. In 1922 was working on a volume editing the African and Western lands. The African Time and Orient Review published by an article, I mean, published an article by Ferris in which he praised an article previously contained in the same journal by Marcus Garvey. All right, so as you can see, William H. Ferris was a support of Marcus Garvey, right? Okay, so um, just like at that time period, there was a heated, a heated uh, conflict between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Okay, so of course, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois was a little bit bougie at the time period. He was a very bougie guy, um, and he was just so... He was so uh, conservative. And Booker T. Washington, by him growing up in the South, he was born to slavery. And he was able to get up out of slavery and managed to uh, open up his own school, which is Tuskegee Institute, which is still around to this day. It's in Tuskegee, Alabama. All right. And but before he even opened that school up, he went to a HBCU. It was Hampton University. At that time, it was just a school. He went to Hampton University. He left Hampton, and he started opening up his own school. So that made him a major success on that level. But anyways, uh, Booker T. Washington's stance was more so about doing for self and doing for the community and things like that, whereas W.E.B. Du Bois was trying to be in more cahoots with uh, his white counterparts and try to bring about reform and things like that. So basically, uh, 
William H. Ferris was rocking with W.E.B. Du Bois, and then later he was rocking with Marcus Garvey because when Marcus Garvey came in with the UNIA movement and all of that, of course, he was on that same level. As a matter of fact, Marcus Garvey was so influenced by Booker T. Washington. So he never got a chance to meet Booker T because by the time, by the time he uh, touched down to America, Booker T had passed away. So his main purpose was to come to America and meet Booker T. Washington. So Marcus Garvey was so influenced and seeing that what Booker T was doing as far as building his own school, that inspired him to start the UNIA, all right? And there's so many others who inspired him. Uh, Herbert uh, Harrison inspired Marcus Garvey. Also, uh, Duse Ali Muhammad inspired Marcus Garvey as well. So... So William Henry Ferris uh, ended up supporting Garvey, and he was right behind Garvey. He was an advocate of Garvey. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? I'm doing all right. Thank you for asking, brother. Peace, brother. How you doing? Peace, peace, peace. How you doing? Thank y'all for coming through. I appreciate that. All right, so... Um, there's some more information about uh, William Henry Ferris. All right, so let me go ahead and uh, pull this up. So William Henry Ferris. The source is the Journal of Negro History, volume 26, number four. And it came out in 1941, all right? So right under here. So on the 23rd of August, William H. Ferris died suddenly in obscurity in his room at 10th West, 123rd Street, and his body was saved from the potter's field through the action of the treasurer of Yale, a member of Ferris' class of 1895, who sent a contribution of $300 to defray the cost of funeral expenses. The eulogy over his remains was delivered by Reverend J.A. Portlock of the Bethel AME Church on West 132nd. Yeah, uh, West 132nd Street on the 26th of August. Representatives of the Yale class of 1895 attended the services. Ferris attended Harvard University also as a student in the Divinity School from 1897 to 1899. He transferred to the graduate school where he studied journalism from 1899 to 1900 and received a degree of Master's of Art, right? Thus passed from this life a man whose career is difficult to estimate. He was born in New Haven, Connecticut on J July the 20th, 1874. There he attended the Hill House High School and then Yale. Although well informed, he never showed in show the initiative to take the leadership in any field or succeed at any of the many things which he undertook. He failed as a teacher and preacher. He served mainly as an assistant to others. Editorial staffs on which he worked during his career are too numerous to mention. He never remained at any post long until he became associated with the Universal Negro Improvement Association founded by Marcus Garvey. In the Back to Africa movement, which Garvey started, he had a need for an organ which took the name of the ne Negro world. On this staff, Ferris served a number of years satisfactory as literary editor and helped to make this journal the most widely circulated news, I mean, Negro newspaper, which has been published in the Western Hemisphere. At one time, it had a circulation of 200,000 copies. This newspaper passed with the deportation of Garvey from the United States. 
for his career, Ferris wrote a number of pamphlets of more or less value. And in 1913, one outstanding work of two volumes entitled The African Abroad and His Evolution in Western Civilization, tracing his development of the Caucasian Malu. This produ production, like the author himself, contains some parts which deserve much praise and others which cannot be evaluated highly. Yet, although those who watch Ferris' long preparation for life often express themselves as disappointed with his achievement, his career as a whole cannot be neglected by the historian. After all, that may be said, pro and con, he left sufficient evidence of work to, comp to, compile, uh, to compel the English-speaking world to remember that he wrote, remember that he once lived. It says a committee of his class of Yale 95 consisting of Lanier McKee, Roger S. Baldwin, Alan Waldwell, and publishing a notice of the death of Ferris said a brilliant scholar. Many of us will recall his penetrating comprehension of the course in psychology under Professor Ladd and the latter's expression of delight at his understanding. Later, he received an MA degree from both Yale and Harvard and then entered upon his life work as a teacher, editor, pastor, and a knowledge leader in the promotion of the welfare of his people. The recipient of many honors, his impressive work, the, Ameri the African Abroad is an outstanding encyclopedic study and presentation of the Negro and his achievement in all lands. With with such a remarkable record of accomplishment, he was indeed a credit to his university and his country. All right. So that's that information that goes on about his death um, and talking about a little bit about his life and his legacy and whatnot. So. All right. And by the way, ASALA, which is Association for the Study of African American Life and History, was uh, founded by Carter G. Woodson. Carter G. Woodson founded this. So, you know, Carter G. Woodson was a big scholar. He was big on that. He made, he opened up doors for a lot of them, a lot of these scholars today. He really did. He was really big. That was his only focus was journalism, scholarship, and history. Like, he really was very big on it. Yes, yes. Peace, peace, Santabo. Peace. Peace. Thank you for coming through. All right. So I have some um, information that you guys can look at. Um, so I got some materials here. So three of the books that he had written so far. And these books can be found on Google. You can download them for free. Okay. You can download them for free. All right. So it says the African abroad, William H. Ferris. And that's him again, right there. Okay. The University of Michigan Libraries. All right, this is the first volume and it was written in 1913. All right, so this is chapter one. All right, chapter one is, was it a uh, narrow cassette reversi upon the internal and ephemeral in human life and history. 
So it goes on to say, as I selected for a task given to the world an interpretation of the hopes and longing and strivings and aspiration of the black man in a record of his deeds and achievement, I thought of the larger life of mankind of which the life of the Negro is, but an eddy in a stream. I pulled back the curtains of time and saw savage man emerging from the caves thousands of years ago. I saw how he learned the use of fire and master the art of writing i saw him dwelling in communities and develop developing states i saw him offering sacrifice to avenging deity and then rise to the lofty conception of internal one i saw nations rise and fall dynasties come and go saw great men play their part in the drama of human history and pass on into oblivion oblivion and then I asked, what is the significance of the toil and struggle of the effort and aspiration of man, of the blood and tears he has shed? What is human history? Is there any meaning to history? It is a divine poem, epic, and it's sweet. Is it a world drama? Is there a mighty power, a mastermind behind the currents shifting the scene? I will relate the experiences that led me to reflect upon the meaning of history and man's place in the universe. All right, so let's see what else. Let's kind of skip down just a little bit. It says, it was a beautiful August morning when I started for Tower Hill, one of those days when poets love to sing. As I look up at the sun shining with all its sky high splendor casting its rays here and there and felt the invigorating breeze as it swept over the Atlantic, I was moved by it. I went up the road and turned into the lane that led that leads to the wood. I listened to the singing of the birds, to the chirping of the crickets, and saw what variety nature threw around me. I looked at those large fire trees that formed an arch over my head. Saw the sunbeams as they peeped through the leaves of the trees and cast a yellow glow on some spots and left a dark shade where they did not alight. Across the field, I could see the cows grazing, the bright sparkling water, and the mountains in the distance. I contrasted the different forms of vegetation from the deepest green to the brightest yellow. So let's go to the next chapter. All right, so chapter two, it says, God revealed in the course of human history and the movement of human spirit in its historical development, the meaning of history. As I have studied history, two questions have constantly forced themselves upon me. What is the meaning of history? Is the hand of God revealed in the movement of human history? Does the way in which human, I mean, which man has moved along in his historical development, does the influence of, does the influence of great men upon history, does the moral or that is revealed in history does the fact that history shows that religion is the deepest thing about man prove anything with regard to the nature of the world ground i think so i will endure in this chapter to give a brief survey of the course of human history to show the part that great men have played in history and the secret of their influence all right so going a little further down he says all human history is implicable and incapable of being explained if human history is not the manifestation of the self-revealing life of an intimate God who is the center and source of all human progress because he is the intimate source and ground of the ideas and instincts which have been the propelling cause of human progress. If this universe is not rational to the core and by rational to the core, we mean that the universe is the manifestation of a self-conscious mind. If moral principles are not interwoven in the very well 
and wolf of the universe embedded in the structure and nature of the universe itself if if this universe is but the result of the accidental and for touch what for fortress play of the diverse atoms if human history is but an accidental result of the play of blind mechanical force then is not only all human history all ethics art and religion is an illusionary dream but life itself is an illusion a monstrous farce if he if history is to be understood if human history is to be interpreted it can only be as we recognize in a deep way though it may be the presence of god in human nature and history there is one set of students of history who regards man as a product of physical condition the resultant of physical forces in their estimation he is a child of nature they say that history is accounted for by the action and interaction of physical and psychological forces the interaction of known physical laws accounted for the development of history and by a study of those laws can we can predict with a probability approaching to certainty the course of history this is the biological the mechanical and anthropological view of history it is a materialistic view of human character human life and human history all right so as you can see um not to go any further but just to give an idea um he goes in to talk about human history uh because he's talking about the evolution part and of course you can see that he's incorporating with some concept of god because by him being a pastor at the time period at the time that he wrote this book he had a connection with spirituality so he understood some form of science but he understood science through the eye of spirituality so he connects spirituality and science together um and you have to remember during his time period this book came out in 1913. uh by his book being out in 1913 he did not have what we had. He did not have the technological advance back then like we do today. Uh, there was no such thing as DNA. Okay. You weren't able to abstract DNA like you do today. All right. You can go abstract DNA. You can find out more information. You can find out more evidence. Right. But at that time period, it was also, it was just based on trial and error. You know, it was based off of lookership. It was based off of, um, the bones things like that so they didn't have enough information that's all the information they could go by you know so that's why you was hearing information about black people uh, uh not only in africa but you know you had blacks uh in what he said place what they say places like in um in australia and all of that in all these different places and stuff so they will always make an argument that black people was everywhere and it's not necessarily the case you know what i'm saying um it's not that you know there was black people that was everywhere but you know every uh ancient uh monuments is not consist of a black face all right every ancient person wasn't black you know they were coming from other ethnic groups other ethnic background so but but then you know at that time 1913 what did they really know they only knew based off the information they had available all right so you guys can go ahead and check his book out and i'm just gonna go ahead and leave that book right there
And you guys can also check out another book. This book right here is called Alexander Cromwell and Apostle of Negro Culture, the American Negro Academy, Occasional, which was written by William Henry Ferris. Of course, uh, Alexander Cromwell was uh, very prominent within the Pan-African movement, and he was one of the first to keep the movement, you know, to help develop, organize the movement and whatnot. So the idea of Pan-Africanism was always around, all right? But as far as the movement goes, you know, he was one of the first people that was very active in the movement. And, yep. and of course, Alexander Crom Cromwell was um, of a religious background, just like the rest of his counterparts was. So maybe one day I can do a topic on Alexander Crom Cromwell if I have not done so. All right, but that's his uh information. That's the book right there. So I do have the book downloaded on my Kindle, but I'm not gonna go into it today. So you guys can check it out. Uh, you guys can look it up on Amazon. It's um $9.95, it's around ten dollars on paperback, or you can download it for free on your Kindle. Yep. All right, so let's look at African Abroad. Uh, this is the part two. It's called the Basic Afro-American Reprint Library. Uh, so this book was reprinted. All right, so this is the volume two. All right, so right here, on this says African civilization and Professor Chamberlain on the Negro in ancient civilization. It goes on to say, perhaps the reader has been perplexed and bewildered by the multiple theories advanced in the recent chapters. Three of the positions taken are tenable with regards to the fourth. The result is a drawn battle, but more can be said than against it. First, it is undoubtedly true that the ancient Ethiopians obtained a high degree of civilization. Secondly, it is probably true that there was a strain of Negro blood in the ancient Egyptian race. Thirdly, it is probably true that there was more Negro than Caucasian, Hamitic, and Semitic blood in the Ethiopian race, and it is possible that Negro strain was predominant. It says, with regards to the Mediterranean origin of civilization and the fact of the Negro in remote antiquity being a remote branch of this race, I am not enough of a anthologist to speak with what the german philosopher kant would call apodic apoditic certainty some intimate authorities have supported the former view and others both the former and the latter view but i will not be the judge i will present the evidence and permit the readers to read his verdict i will let the authorities md mclean chamberlain boney herodotus jy myers Angelo, Masso, Sergi speak for themselves in their own language. All right. 
So right here it says Haiti, the Black Republic. It goes on to say situated in the Atlantic Ocean about four times as long and six times as wide as Long Island with a salubrious climate with a virgin soil that is wonderfully rich and fertile with hills and valleys covered with large splendid trees and perfume laden flowers. Haiti with her color population of the two million is indeed an ideal spot for a black republic. All right, so it goes in to talk about Haiti history. Right, it's talk about the progress of the colored people in America based on the census of 1900 and preceding census. All right, it says 50 years ago today, while the Northern Negro owned at least $20 million worth of property, the free Southern Negroes of Charleston, New Orleans, Fayetteville, Wilmington, New Bern, North Carolina, and other places over $25 million. The masses in the South hardly owned the brogans upon their feet, but... But in 1900, Negroes in 12 southern states owned about 173,375 farms, paid taxes upon nearly $700 million worth of property, and supported 28,000 churches. The Negroes in Georgia alone owned $30 million worth of taxable property. In 1900, Negroes in the South owned and controlled over 50 banks, 33 of them well capitalized and organized and nearly 100 insurance companies. There were over 100 colors drug stores in the United States. In 1900, color men throughout the country edited about 500 newspaper and nine magazines. The Penny Saving Bank in Birmingham, Alabama and the True Reformers Society of Richmond, Virginia are conspicuous examples of colored men cooperating business. In 1890, the Negro occupied and operated 594,642 farms, of which 22% were owned by him, and occupied 861,137 houses. In 1900, the Negro owned 23,770 church edifices, and church properties value at $26,626,000. And in 1909, 35,000 church edifices worth $56 million with nearly 4 million members. Today, 1913, the aggregated wealth of 10 million American Negroes approximately approximates close to a billion dollars and probably exceeded it. So, so that was the census of um, African-Americans during that time period in the 1900s. So obviously um, there were those who were very successful and they were booming as far as business wise and property wise, et cetera. And also they made some decent in income. So, as you can see, that's the census, that's the information um, for the 1900s during that time period and prior to that. All right. So I'm not going to go any further, but you guys can uh, check this book out for yourself, which is the part two of it. And you can download it on Google. All right. You can download it and read it for free on Google. It's called The Basic Afro-American reprinted library that's the part two and it is the african abroad etc so you guys can check it out and also uh supreme understanding if you guys are familiar with supreme understanding of law he also has some books out about um about william uh ferris so you guys can uh, either go on his website, and I can't remember the name of his website, or you can look it up on Amazon. Just type in William Henry Ferris, and you will see uh, Supreme Understanding books. So he he's the editor, so he you know 
edit the book or whatnot. Um, you can find it for yourself. So you just go on Amazon and just get it like that. So, all right. But until then, this your girl Tiffany. And I'm going to go ahead and log off. With that being said, you guys have a good one. Thank you all for tuning in. I appreciate the support. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell. If you want to share this video, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, and that's that. So, all right, you guys. Um, you guys take it easy. Peace and power and elevation. And I'll do with y'all later. All right.